Hello, and welcome to Big Idea 2, Interaction Among Branches. It's a sad day because this bird pooped almost on that bird. Anyway, so we're really looking at the three branches of government as espoused by Madison in Federalist 51, the idea of separation of powers, legislative Congress, executive, the president and his cabinet, and then judicial branch of the Supreme Court. So you're looking at what can each one do, checks and balances, um, things of that nature. Some of this came, of course, across in um, Big Idea 1, but we'll re-articulate. So as you're watching this, if I click this, hopefully this works. Oh, there I'm going to be on TV. Oh, maybe not. That's supposed to make me on TV. Why is it? Oh, I have the thing covered up so the government can't spy on me. Let me free it. There I am. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm just one of those weirdos that thinks about that. I don't know. Um, have this sheet out, right? And you should be taking notes on this. It is weighted at 50 points, and you'll be able to use this on the roll uh quizzes. So do that. You can also use your textbook to find this information or um, – just Google some of the things as long as you – the real key is to, to I mean, understand the vocab in the context of the objectives. So that is the idea as we go forward. I'm going to make you copies of this. I shared with this digitally, um, but I'm going to make copies for you as well. I think this is a helpful tool, mostly for those going forward with the exam. But it also gives me an idea of, you know, specifically what I should be um, covering. You know, there's a lot of things, like on the first slides, Congress can do. What should be the emphasis according to College Boar, our new masters in Overlord. So I don't like that thing on because I don't know where – it's just I'm going to turn it off. So bye. All right. So, again, fast forward if you need to, but let's move on. I said let's move on. So let's move on. There we go. All right. So here's Baron de Montesquieu. He was the original French philosopher who talked about the um, three branches of government. So we give him a shout out there. But it's really Madison's 51 Federalist paper that will um, drive that idea home. So just a fun little quote. So 2A, really looking at describe the powers and functions of Congress. So you have to know Congress is bicameral, two houses as part of the Great Compromise. I kind of think that as you come into this class, you understand that and that you have a basic understanding of, of that from U.S. history. If you don't... Um, yeah, I don't know. You need to. We'll do my best, but we don't have time to sit there and go over things that you should already have a basic understanding of. So we get a little more specific. So my goal is to get through one, two, and three in this slideshow, which is quite a bit of vocab, and, and that's really all it is. And then we'll look to apply it in class as much as we can because um, I want to get class uh, going in some simulations and discussions unless this, just none of this is that – how do I describe the powers and functions of Congress in a fun, unique way? It's difficult. So let's take a look. So you can look at all of those. Um, we just talked about, you know, coining money as an example. I put this on two slides now so you can see it better. So what things should we emphasize on this? You know, really the idea um, would be passing the federal budget is a huge thing that Congress must be do. Um, in order to do so, they have to raise revenue through taxation, and they also coin money. So those are three big ones you definitely want to jot down. If you go to the war powers, Congress declares war, and their job is to maintain the armed forces, usually through monetary spending. I have a simulation that deals with that. I can't wait to actually do it. should be good. should be good. Um, and then really – other than that, be familiar with the necessary and proper clause and the implied powers that that um, represents. That gives them wide range of economic, environmental, social issues in order to, to have powers to do as they seem fit. So, um, you know, if you hang your head on just those, passing the budget, raising Revenue, so taxation, coin to money, declaring war, focusing on the military, and understand the idea of the ne the necessary and proper cause and how that is such a big deal. That's really where I anticipate a lot of the direction of 
the questioning on the exam going, necessary and proper being very huge with that. Here are some others though. But again, I'm looking at the curriculum guide too, and we've already, I've, I've given you what they're telling me they should do. So if you wanna write down more, like to grant patents and copyrights, be my guest, pause the screen and do so. Okay, so another trick to this, I'm not gonna be showing these in class, but you need to watch these. They're, they're like eight minutes long. This will go into the details of the bicameral Congress. You know, understanding that there's two houses, they each have different terms, um, when they're elected, um, how they're elected is different. This guy is not John Green, but he does a little better job. So what you need to do and able to watch this is on Canvas, um, I'll have a slideshow and then I'll have the podcast. You need to go into the slideshow and then open it and watch it through that. Or you can just Google it and go from there as well. So please check out the bicameral Congress idea because that really goes into 2A2, comparing the Senate and the House of Representatives in terms of how constituencies, lawmaking authority and roles affect the policymaking process. So you have to look at the idea of the policymaking process. Um, when we talk about constituencies, that's the people who voted them into office. You also look at the authority they have in passing those things. So this, this big idea, as you look at the Senate and the House, are different for very different reasons, or for, yeah, for different reasons, absolutely, um, in terms of creating a balance. And it gets a little dicey, but there's a couple ways to look at that. I'm going to pause this for one second, get some water. I'm back from my water break. Moving on. All right, so general differences. You just have to look at a few of these, not all of them. Start with the idea of a two-year term versus a six-year term and think of how that would affect your relationship with each other. Um, imagine you started dating somebody and you knew you only had to date them for two years. So in that case, they're your constituency. After, I mean, what can you tolerate for two years with knowing that you're going to dump them, you know, versus a six-year term and what that does with your relationship. So with the House and the Senate, you know, once I'm voted in the Senate for six years, I don't really have to worry about my constituencies, meaning the people who voted for me. They're going to forget I'm even there. I don't have to come back to that until year five, maybe. But the House with a two-year term, as soon as I'm in, I pretty much has, have to... Uh, be responsive to what they need me to do. So I constantly have to stay in contact with, you know, um, this is what the anti-federalists would want it. I have to stay more localized to what the people want. The Senate can hold their nose in the air and also, um, you know, sort of not worry about the common people's thoughts because they don't have to deal with them so much. If it wasn't for the 17th Amendment, they'd never have to deal with them, really. Look at the size of people, you know, Try to make a decision, come to a coalition with 435 people versus 100 people. That's going to change your relationships. And also in the 435, you don't like somebody and they're in their second term, they might be gone the next year. So you gotta, you're got you constantly shifting alliances. So the Senate is much more stable in that idea. You know, And so to me, just looking through those, those are the – the primary ideas if you're looking at that objective of how that affects the policy making decision. Um, our simulation we're going to do is going to hit on that a little bit. I mean, just with your game we played and are still playing under President Jeff uh, can change a lot. The idea of you only have 19, or counting me, 19 people in this class. It's different when you play that game with 19 versus when I have a class of 36, which is what I had one year running this game it got much more chaotic people didn't know who it was but at the same time i mean each had its advantages and disadvantages um so that's where you go the other things in there i don't know you can focus on them if you want not all that important um this one episode six congressional elections deals with that point if i remember correctly um maybe i'll go back and rewatch these at some point but the idea of having a six year versus a two year and how that affects 
your ability to actually make and pass laws. Uh, with modern media, the objection is once you, once you actually win election, these guys are actually spend so much time on the phone trying to get campaign donations that they do very little governing at all. And that is a critique of our system is maybe to extend the time period now um, based on modern media and the information influx, things of that nature with it. Re-elect Wheezy. That's funny to me. I don't even know who Wheezy is. Is it a rapper? Is it this guy? Sounds like Probably not. I think that's a little John. Okay. So the Speaker of the House, formerly Paul Ryan, I haven't updated this, uh, but he is from Madison, Wisconsin, and he's got a big gavel. Ours is cooler, as only me or John Massman, President Massman, could attend to. So what is his role? So he is the presiding officer over the House. So what does that do for him? He controls the agenda would be the biggest thing. So the things that actually get called to a vote, that to me is the biggest, most important idea of the Speaker of the House with that. And so he's elected by the members of the House. So what you tend to see is the majority in control of the House, which right now is currently the Republicans by polling data. That's not going to be lasting too long after November. The Democrats, they will all get together and vote and they'll be on the same page because they want to make sure that they have the majority and get their guy in there so they can control the um, agenda. You can also see second in line of the presidential succession after the vice president. So if assassination, heart attack happens, that person becomes um, an important figure or two impeachments, for example. I'm not even off the top of my head. I can't remember who the Speaker of the House is right now. But Paul Ryan, I believe, has resigned. Um, for a lot of reasons. They always say it's because of family. I think a lot of it had to do with the mess of the executive at this point. But I don't want to make these two time work because I want to use these year to year. Um, controls the calendar. So when they meet, when they don't meet. And you can look at leads appointment process of committee chairs. Um, I get this role too as the union president. That we have many, many different committees. I have the power to pick who I actually want to chair them. So within the committees, I'm going to pick like-minded people, just like Mr. Ryan would, to then again control the agenda, control what we talk about, control what we vote on. And then you can see nationally this person becomes the speaker of that party. So that's the speaker of the house, the big hammer. Dun, dun, dun. All right, so the filibuster. Again, this is looking at... So if you go back to the objective, the idea here is how they affect policymaking. The Speaker House should be clear. A filibuster is kind of a, a weird thing, and it goes with the term uh, closure as well. So a filibuster is you can request the floor, and the way it works, you're not done holding the floor until you yield it, which is by literally saying, I yield the floor by giving permission to someone else to speak or by having a break in when you're talking. So these are used a lot of times to delay a bill from being voted on. So it's usually done by a minority party that thinks at some point they can muster up the votes they need. So what they'll do is just go up there and talk. And there have been cases where people have read Dr. Seuss things and just ramble, 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 um, read stories, read Harry Potter books to force the session to go closed, just like we run out of time in class and then gives them more time outside of the session to then get the vote. So there is a way to stop a filibuster, and that is through cloture, which means, as you can see, you need two-third vote of the Senate to do that. So filibusters only take place in the Senate, not in the House of Representatives. So those are just another strategies you can use we could have probably many years ago uh, when I first started playing this game, we um, I had a kid try to filibuster the whole class. Hey, I'm podcasting, but you're cool. I forgot we had a different time schedule on the late start. Uh, so I'm going to pause it and come back to this at lunch. But filibuster culture, two other tactics to stop legislation. 
I'll be back. For you, it'll feel like a second. For me, it's going to be like an hour. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I'm back. Like I said, for you, it won't be a second, but I'm back. Okay. Uh, and perhaps you could even sing a song to filibuster legislation. We got to find a way. I'm going to have you guys redesign that whole simulation that's almost concluding. So we can work some more of these ideas in there. But let's just look at some more vocabulary here. And all of this, oh, actually, watch this video on your own too. It's pretty funny, filibuster from the show Parks and Rec. They actually have a really, really long one by Patton Oswalt, if you know who that comedian slash actor is, where he just filibusters for like eight minutes talking about the Star Wars franchise. I didn't put it on though. I'm wasting enough of your time, I'm sure. Okay, so if we go back to the objective, right? We're still looking at the policymaking process and how the Senate and the House, um, in comparison, what they do. So again, you just have to know these terms. So let's say you run for either a House of Representation or the House of Representatives or a Senator. So you have some options of how you then are going to act or choose to govern as you actually, um, sorry, I was looking at my soundboard and forgot what I was saying. Um, you know, how are you going to vote on certain issues? So if you go as a role of a delegate, your idea is, as it says there, you're going to want to look at your campaign promises and vote in accordance with that. That's what got you there was doing what your people wanted to. So you'd be very interested in almost day to day public opinion polling to see what your constituents want you to do. So you're, you're really probably in that case, the true sense of a representative. That is your people. You look at what they, what they want and then you just uh, do it. Exactly. You just do it. What the people want you to. And that's it. Straight up democracy in action right there. The next biggest of these you definitely want to focus on is the idea of a trustee and what that looks. So the trustee is you're elected and now it's ego time. It's the idea that they elected me because they know what I'm doing. They trust me, so to speak. Trustee means you trust me to make the decisions um, going forward. So you might not like everything I do, but you should trust me, the trustee, to get the job done. Um, so of those two, if we look at it, a question to pros would be which of those two ideas would you find more likely in the Senate versus the House? Now, this is where we don't have a discussion, but we could discuss that later. You know, would you find a delegate or a trustee more in the House and vice versa, delegate and trustee in the Senate? Because you look at the terms of two years for six years and your accountability to the people being reelected, you go from there as well. All right. So a couple other ones that are not necessarily um, in our curriculum, really, is a politico. You simply are there not because you believe in yourself and your professionalism or represent the people. You're there because it's your career. So you're going to do whatever you can to get reelected. And that that's it. So, again, very similar to um, a delegate in a sense, as long as you think the people are going to show up to vote. But the bottom line is any way you want. And then the other part of it is a partisan. So partisanship. You will simply subscribe to what your elder party leaders tell you to do. And if you don't, they might pull funding from you and um, demote you from different committees and such. So you're kind of the brown noser of the group there. But in a sense, that is very much like a political because that might make you get reelected because you might need those campaign um, Finances. So Jeff, as you're ruling as a representation, uh, representative of, you know, whatever, which one will you govern as? A delegate, a trustee, a political? I don't know. My name is Jeff. We'll find out. Okay, still coming back to the objective. That's the whole point. Keep this vocab flowing towards the objective. 
looking at policy making, a couple of other vocab, both dealing with images, pork barrel and log rolling. So pork barrel is really the idea of wanting to get reelected. So let's say I'm trying to think of an example of pork barrel legislation. Um, let's say you are working in a region uh, where Seattle, Washington is. Seattle, Washington is home of Boeing. Boeing produces uh, military grade weapons in addition to um, jet planes as well. So there might be legislation on the on the board, anything, something to doing with increasing funding for the defense. Even though you might be an anti-war proponent, you need to bring home the bacon. So by voting for something pro-war or pro-defense is going to increase the contracts to a place like Boeing, which is going to increase their bottom, their bottom line, in essence, creating more jobs and fueling people in the district. So you would come home and say, look, at I voted this way. I brought home the bacon. I delivered um, within that. Um, uh, another example, I mean, with really tough, you know, with, with Illinois, because there's the three Illinois kind of idea out there. I'm trying to think of one that would, that would work. You know, it's, it's the idea, let's say if I'm from downstate, a rural area, what do they want? Even if I'm a conservative who doesn't like government spending, I might vote on legislation that calls for um, subsidies for farmers, basically government money for farmers who are struggling, I'm bringing home the bacon. So I'm not really driven by ideology. I'm driven by re-election. Log rolling is quid pro quo. So it's the idea of we're just rolling bills together for to get the job done. So I may be adamantly opposed to, let's just use the same scenario, Boeing and farmers, you know, one candidate might or congressperson might be up, opposed the legislation for uh, increasing military funding. Uh, another one might be opposed to giving aid to farmers. So what do they do? Quid pro quo. I will vote for your bill. You vote for my bill. That way we can both bring home the bacon and get reelected, which then brings us back to this, the idea of political, et cetera, et cetera. So it's complicated, but these are the, the kind of things you need to consider when looking to answer that question is how do these, these different vocab words affect how decisions are made in the Senate or the House? So, yeah, I mean, I, hopefully I can find like some of these type of exam questions that will help with that. But, again, there's a lot of vocabulary, as there is in any class. But those ideas, log rolling, pork barrel, trustee, delegate, cloture, filibuster, speak of the house's role, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, funny. Hey, look at that. The benefits of camouflage. I don't even know if I get it. Well, let's actually look at this one. Maybe we should look at this one in class. Maybe we should. So we got pork. Looks like the media is focused on domestic spending. So the idea of government is spending money over there to help the economy probably. And they're being accused of just doing it for job creations. But the media is not focusing on military spending. But if you actually look at military spending, it does. I mean, hmm. I'll leave it to you to figure out. I probably need to put like a prompt or something with it. Funny though, two pigs. <laughs> all right, two a three. Don't know if we'll get through all of this. I'm already got 25 minutes. I don't want to go past a half hour, for sure. And there is an activity I want to spend um, part of the day doing. It's pretty cool. Uh, a simulation that I didn't come up with. It's actually like a video game. I played it. It's really cool. So we're looking at explaining how congressional behavior. Same idea, which it can go right into policymaking, is influenced by election processes, partisanship, and divided government. So we, again, let's just break that whole thing down. Explain how congressional behavior, so what Congress people do based on an election process, so that, you know, being reelected and running for election, 
Um, how is behavior changed by partisanship? That means really the idea of divided government is what partisanship kind of means, that each party is isolated from each other and therefore divided. How do you get anything done? How do you ever govern? Hmm. I don't know why I picked that button. Not at all. All right. Um, you know what? Let's just – well, let's go down here. Congressional leadership. Um, this one will get into some details. It'll, it'll deal with the Speaker of the House. It'll deal with um, other members of Congress known like as the whip, whose job is to get people all in line to make sure. So that's that whole partisanship there. Uh, this gets a little complicated for sure. But a good video. Some of these videos can fit in multiple episodes. So watch that one at your leisure. I think I have another one. And then this will be a good intro to what we really want to focus on here, which is the idea of gerrymandering. Um, named after the term salamander is where it all comes from. So I would say if you watch that one, that gives us a good place to stop what we're doing for then. So be ready for a quiz over, we won't go into um, this one, but A1 and A2 for show with that. We'll be rolling the dice and we'll start looking at gerrymandering, which all started with this political cartoon that you see here. Um, and we'll go from there. So you have been a most lovely audience. I have been an even lovelier host, obviously. So with that, I say to you, Peace.